Good evening once again as we look at a barren and empty Times Square in New York City. This was day 1156 of the Trump administration, 228 days until the presidential election. It's been nine days since the World Health Organization declared the coronavirus a pandemic. And while there is no joy in saying this whatsoever, despite the numbers you are hearing each day from the White House briefing room, the cavalry is not going to make it in time to save some people. In fact, for some, the cavalry is not coming at all. It's happening too quickly. We lost too much time. That's why the advice from doctors is when around other people, act like you have the virus, act as a sick person would. And if we all do, we can all manage to keep our distance. Then, weirdly, it's distance that will keep us together and alive when we reach the other end of this. And we end this incredibly difficult week in our country. We are now at 18,000 cases, give or take, about four times the number of cases when we started this week. And who among us didn't expect to read some version of this? We're now learning from the Washington Post that U.S. intelligence agencies were issuing ominous classified warnings in January and February about the global danger from coronavirus, while President Trump and lawmakers played down the threat and took no action to slow its spread. Also tonight, a staff member in the vice president's office has tested positive, first known positive test for the virus among White House personnel in the West Wing. Pence's office says this individual had no close contact with the VP or the president. This news comes as more states are taking drastic measures to try to contain this virus. When we were on the air last night, we talked about California's governor, Gavin Newsom, ordering all residents to effectively stay in their homes. Today, the governors of Connecticut, Illinois and New York followed suit with similar mandates. I don't come to this decision easily. I fully recognize that in some cases, I am choosing between saving people's lives and saving people's livelihoods. But ultimately, you can't have a livelihood if you don't have your life. We're going to close the valve, all right, because the rate of increase in the number of cases uh, portends a total overwhelming of our hospital system. We need everyone to be safe. Otherwise, no one can be safe. And think about this. New York State now has the most cases in the U.S., over 7,800. Just tonight, the president, responding to a request from both New York senators, approved a disaster declaration for the state, which will allow it to receive federal assistance. But yes, for headline purposes, this now makes New York a federal disaster area. Europe has become the global epicenter for the outbreak as of right now. In Italy, just today, the death toll rose by 627. That's the highest in a single day. While UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson launched a new nationwide lockdown, telling cafes and pubs and bars and restaurants to close. President Trump today officially has suspended most non-essential traffic across the U.S.-Mexico border as threatened. Trump also insisted he's using his authority under the Defense Production Act to speed up manufacturing, but he gave no clear indication of what, it is, what is exactly being done. I invoked the Defense Production Act, uh, and last night we put it into gear. So yes. you're using it now to tell businesses we are that using you need to make it. ventilators, masks, are, respirators? For certain uh, things that we need, okay. including... Uh, including some of the very important emergency. I would say ventilators, probably more masks uh, to a large extent. We have millions of masks which are coming. You haven't actually directed any companies to start making more ventilators or masks. I have. I have, yes. I have. How many? A lot. We were given no follow-up evidence as to what he was talking about there. Senate Republicans will be working this weekend trying to hammer out a stimulus bill to help Americans Affected by the economic fallout from the pandemic, the goal is to have a bill ready for a vote on Monday. Wall Street Journal notes that under the Senate Republicans opening proposal, Americans who don't make enough money to pay income taxes would be eligible for up to only 
$600. Trump did announce that April 15, the tax deadline would be pushed back, the suspension of some federal student loan payments as well. We're moving tax day from April 15th to July 15th. Families and businesses will have this extra time to file with no interest or penalties. Secretary DeVos has directed federal lenders to allow borrowers to suspend their student loans and loan payments without penalty for at least the next 60 days. And if we need more, we'll extend that period of time. Meanwhile, one member of that White House task force revealed a new clue as to the nature of this virus and who is more likely to survive once infected. From Italy, we're seeing a ver- another concerning trend that the mortality in males seems to be twice in every age group of females. Dr. Anthony Fauci, you see him there on stage, also tried to manage expectations concerning one of President Trump's pronouncements, the anti-malaria drug that the president was talking up so aggressively yesterday. Trump said the FDA had approved it for the virus. Not true. He thinks it could be a game changer. Here is Fauci on that subject. Is there any evidence to suggest that, as with malaria, it might be used as a prophylaxis no. against COVID-19? No, the, the answer is, is no. We're trying to strike a, a balance between making something with a potential of an, a, of an effect uh, to the American people available at the same time that we do it under the auspices of a protocol that will give us information to determine if it's truly safe and truly effective. But the information that you're referring to specifically is anecdotal. Now, that right there set the stage for this exchange between our NBC News White House correspondent, Peter Alexander, and the president. What do you say the Americans were scared, though? I guess nearly 200 dead, 14,000 who were sick, millions, as you witnessed, who are scared right now. What do you say to Americans who are watching you right now who are scared? Uh, I say that you're a terrible reporter. That's what I say. I think it's a very nasty question, and I think it's a very bad signal that you're putting out to the American people. The American people are looking for answers and they're looking for hope. And you're doing sensationalism and uh, the same with NBC and Comcast. I don't call it I don't call it Comcast. I call it Comcast. Let me just for whom you work. Let me just say something that's really bad reporting. And you ought to get back to reporting instead of sensationalism. Let's see if it works. It might and it might not. I happen to feel good about it, but who knows? I've been right a lot. Let's see what happens. So there was that from the president of the United States today. Peter Alexander later talked about that exchange on air. In TV terms, we call this a softball. I was trying to provide the president an opportunity to reassure the millions of Americans, members of my own family and my neighbors in my community and plenty of people sitting at home right now. This was his opportunity to do that, to provide a sort of positive or uplifting, uplifting message. Instead, you saw the president's answer to that question. Meanwhile, two U.S. senators are under pressure to explain some conveniently timed stock sales amid the coronavirus. Senator Richard Burr has reported himself to the Ethics Committee after ProPublica revealed that after reassuring Americans that the government was prepared to combat the virus, quote, the powerful chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee sold off a significant percentage of his stocks. Burr defended his statement to NBC News, saying he relied solely on public news reports to guide my decision. Burr is taking heat from his fellow Republican senator, from North Carolina, the up for re-election Tom Tillis, now saying Senator Burr owes North Carolinians an explanation, and there needs to be a professional and bipartisan inquiry into this matter. Georgia Senator Kelly Loeffler is defending herself after the Daily Beast reported she dumped millions in stock after she received a coronavirus briefing. She has since said she had no knowledge of the sale. Here's what she told Tucker Carlson on Fox News just tonight. These were called closed meetings. They weren't classified. They were closed. But as soon as I got out, the information was already on Twitter. It was in the public domain. None of us believe today what we believed on February 1st.
Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.